recognizing my lengthy list of co-authors, most of whom are in the room, or make up most of the room. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is a big project, and this is actually just one sort of part of a project that we're working on. Um, so I'm sort of making the point Katie made earlier. I'm going to assume this being a grassland bird section of a bird conference. I don't need to talk a lot about the background of grassland birds, so I'll just lay down a few sort of basics that we'll try to build on. Um, so not all patches of habitat are created equally. We know that very well. And we can think of it in a couple different ways, both in terms of specific habitat preferences. We know not all species are looking for the exact same patch of grass. And then, um, as has been mentioned with some of Roz's work and a lot of what Chris Rivick has done, as well as some of the other people here. Um, looking at area sensitivity, so what may look to be a great patch of grass, if it's not sufficiently large, uh, has pretty minimal value. And so then taking that out to the landscape, and this is something that um, you know, we, we know is important that we've been thinking a lot about for the last few years. Um, but what I want to, what I've been thinking about recently is actually bird neighborhoods. Uh, and I can relate this back to being a kid and you know, interacting with someone in the community and they say, oh, I'm your neighbor. And then you find out they live 10 miles away and then someone else might say, well, I'm your neighbor and they're two doors down. So how do you define that neighbor? At what point does it actually mean something? So we want to think about uh, which species actually care. I'm sorry, am I just walking over? That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I forgot we're videotaping things. Um, so which species actually care about their neighborhoods? At what spatial scale do they care? And then could different aspects of the landscape factor into the neighborhood at different at different scales. So do I care more about how far it is to the nearest grocery store relative to the nearest school? Um, so we're going to be using data that we're collecting here in Wisconsin. Uh, these are our three big focal landscapes and particularly we're going to work or look at data collected in these little orange blobs which are 10 grassland bird conservation areas in the state. So we are working in what we think are, are pretty grassy landscapes to start with. Uh, and so hopefully uh, what we're trying to do here, uh, which is both, I'm going to spend, uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll get some better ideas on how to make our grassy landscapes even better. So our methods, and as I go into this, you're going to say I'm going to spend a lot of time on methods because we're presenting this both as some results as well as hopefully a method that can be used uh, in other places in other species. Um, so we're doing uh, pretty standard uh, field methods. We've got habitat-based bird surveys. We're actually out in the field, not on roadsides. Using data collected uh, from the last couple years, 2012 and 2013. We're only going to use data from actual grassy habitats. So Idle grass and pasture, we are collecting data in cropland, but not too surprisingly, we don't find a lot of grassland birds out in the middle of the cornfields, so we're not even going to deal with that data. The method itself is pretty straightforward, just a 10 minute, 100 meter fixed radius point count. We're going to deal with these four species, so Eastern Meadowlark, Bobolink, Kinslow Sparrow, and Grasshopper Sparrow, for a couple of reasons. One, they are species of conservation concern, so we have a lot of interest in them. They represent sort of a range of habitat requirements, so that kind of covers the fact that not all of these species are going to respond to the same landscape exactly the same, so hopefully we can get sort of a distribution of how that response is occurring. And these are the four species that I have enough data with um, to give you good, res <coughs> excuse me, good results. So uh, in order to, as you all know, uh, look at the effect of the landscape, we first have to be able to quantify it. We looked at various different uh, layers and in the end decided to build our own. So using the latest Landsat 8 imagery processed with Envy software, 
as well as a ton of ground truth reference points, we were able to convert those entire big three landscapes into these really colorful maps. Um, and this is uh, Joe Horton, who couldn't be here, uh, was our GIS person who did a great job on this. I don't know anything about this methodology, uh, but if you're interested, Joe's great. And we were able to break our landscape into a number of different habitats. Um, so we've got idle grass, where we're just lumping cool season and warm season. We tried to split it, and we just couldn't get the spectral resolution to do that. We've got cropland, pasture, forest, developed water, maybe a couple other things, but um, based on our ground truth reference points, we felt like we were getting really good classification accuracies. So now just to walk through how we're going to kind of put the data together. Uh, let's say we have just done a bird survey here at this point. <coughs> happens to be idle grass. The next thing I want to think about is area sensitivity. <clears throat> so we're going to delineate that and find it's 11.7 hectares. And now to try to get an idea of that bird neighborhood, we're going to take a very sequential approach to looking at the landscape. So we're going to start out looking very small. So a 50 meter landscape, and then so we categorize uh, what that landscape is, and so we just calculate uh, the cropland, the forest, the idle grass, and the pasture. Those are the only four habitats we're going to deal with. So once we've done that, we're going to forget about that 50 meter buffer and then go to 100 meters, and then 150, and over and over, out to three kilometers. <clears throat> so very stepwise, a lot of Arc processing time to do that. <clears throat> For the analysis, we're then going to use uh, hierarchical single season patch occupancy models. Uh, these have been around for a while. If you're not familiar, they're very nice. They're hierarchical in the sense that we're going to estimate the probability of detection. We know we're not seeing every bird out there. Uh, so we'll deal with that. And then we can then estimate the probability of site occupancy condition on <coughs> that detection <coughs> probability. Now often we spend a lot of time talking about detection probabilities. We're going to completely ignore it. Uh, for what I'm interested in today, it doesn't matter, so just trust me, it's been modeled, it's in there, and now forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to dig a lot deeper into these to the actual occupancy side of the um, and so we're going to use this little Greek letter psi to represent patch occupancy. And we're going to have a lot of models, but they all have this same format. So here we're modeling the occupancy of eastern meadowlarks as a function of patch area to account for area sensitivity and some component of the landscape at some scale. So we'll just say the proportion cropland within 50 meters. We run that model and then we follow it up with a nearly identical model, just changing our landscape scale. So we'll do that out two, three kilometers in increments of 50 meters. So that gives us 60 models per species per habitat type. But we're dealing with four habitats, idle grass, pasture, cropland, and forest. So a total of 240 models per species. But the nice thing is we're not going to have to do a lot of model selection and model averaging. We'll use all 240. Um, but first, I, I need to point out, all of these explanatory variables, so the patch area and our proportions have been standardized to have a mean of zero and a variance of one. It's a simple little transformation that seems kind of odd, but it's nice because it puts everything on the exact same scale so we can make direct comparisons. That's kind of what we're heading next. But first, let's dig into this model a little deeper. So take a very similar example. Let's write it a little more technically uh, into a linear equation. And um, just thinking back to regression, uh, beta naught is just our intercept. We're not too interested in that guy, so we'll forget about him. X1 is a column of explanatory variables. Uh, and here we'll say, it being our first one, it's our patch area. Beta 1 is really important. This is our parameter estimate that we're um, modeling. Uh, that our analysis is actually estimating. And it's a measure of the effect size. It's how important patch area is at predicting 
occupancy, and I'll use that term effect size a lot. Moving on through. Now x2 is just our second explanatory variable, and beta2, again, is that parameter estimate telling us the effect size of that explanatory variable. <clears throat> you can forget about epsilon, he's just an error term, we don't care. Um, so now, from here on out, we're going to forget about birds and landscapes, and we're going to think in terms of betas. Um, so we're going to think about how these effect sizes change, and so we need to establish a couple features of these betas, they can be positive <coughs> or negative. I know this, a lot of this is pretty uh, familiar to those of you who do modeling. But <clears throat> so that positive or negative tells you which direction the effect is. And then the size is meaningful as it gets close to zero. It's having very little effect on the occupancy. So we run all 240 models, pull those betas out, and build a new data set just of those. So we've got our scale. And then the effect size of patch area, and this is not going to change because the actual patch doesn't change with scale. It is the patch. But these, the effect of cropland is going to change, hopefully, with scale. So once we've built this, we'll then use some non-parametric Mars models to look at how these patterns change through space. And we'll walk through the bob link, since people can be really interested in bob links because of bras. <laughs> Um, we'll walk through that example really slowly, uh, so just to make sure everyone understands, because it, sometimes this starts getting complicated. We've got our betas, or our effect size, over here. They can be positive, they can be negative, and if they get close to zero, they're not very meaningful. And then we've got our landscape scale from 50 to 3,000 meters there at the bottom. So we'll start with the effect of forest, and we get this nice, fairly straight line um, from our, our Mars model. But what does that mean? Uh, so what I'm going to interpret this as is evidence of a scale effect. Uh, so we're seeing bobolinks are not responding to the effect of forest equally at all landscape scales. As we get really big scales, they're getting close to a zero effect but really nearby, they really don't like forest. So that's telling me if I'm managing a patch of property, I want to get rid of forest in the immediate landscape. Now if I can affect things out to three kilometers, great. But that first few hundred meters is what I'm really going to be interested in. <clears throat> Cropland, as we would suspect, is still negative, but up close it's pretty minimal. And I'm going to say, I interpret that as once the bob link has settled on the patch, if there's some corn nearby, it's still kind of grassy, it's open, it's not trees, so it's probably okay. But out at three kilometers, it's getting really negative. So when they're flying in, trying to decide where to settle, they're looking at the big landscape and saying, this doesn't look right, it's all tilled up, the vegetation's in straight rows, I'm going to avoid this. Pasture is very positive, and we see this nice increase. Uh, so in a very small landscape, it's positive, but out to about one kilometer, it steadily increases in its positive effect. And then kind of levels out and even decreases in effect. So we're interpreting this as a big opportunity window. So if we've got a patch of habitat, we want to increase the value of that. Let's look within one kilometer and try to promote grazing good responsible pasture in that area. If we can affect the bigger landscape, great. But that first kilometer is where we get our biggest bang for the buck. Idle grass, this one's odd. <clears throat> um, starts negative, goes positive, back negative, and it's never far from zero. That result's a little confusing, so we'll just move on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then the last thing is just uh, circling back to patch area. We see it's a positive effect, but it's not all that strong. Um, so we can probably do more by thinking about increase or improving the landscape than we can by improving or increasing patch size. So just to pull the, uh, the highlights together. Pasture is important, positive, particularly within a kilometer. 
forest is bad, particularly nearby, and they're weakly area sensitive. Now I've got those plots for all the other species, but as you saw, they take a long time for me to go through, so we're just going to throw everything into this table and hit the highlights. <clears throat> so eastern meadowlark actually, we found, responded very similarly to bobolink, where they like pasture, but here they weren't scale sensitive. The line's pretty much flat, so pasture at any and every scale is good for eastern meadowlarks. Forest, uh, again, was negative, particularly within about 700 meters. That's our big window of opportunity for this species. And we found virtually no evidence of meadowlarks <coughs> being area sensitive. So just having grass is good for them and not having forest. Grasshopper sparrows uh, we had a bit of a, a little different and kind of surprising. We thought this is a tiny little bird. He's going to respond to small landscapes. But the biggest positive influence was idle grass at one and a half kilometers. Um, <clears throat> and then found a pretty uh, strong area effect. So they want big patches with a lot of idle grass on the big landscape around them. And then Henslow Sparrow um, responded more like what we were expecting. Negative effect of pasture really nearby. I say out to 500 meters, really the first one or 200 meters is where it's really very strongly negative. Idle grass is very positive. I say out to 700, but again, it's the first couple hundred meters that are really important. And then they are incredibly area sensitive. So they want big patches, and then right around that patch, they want a lot of idle grass and not um, pasture. So I realized the thing I didn't include here was crop, because we can summarize that really easily. I don't need to talk about each species. Cropland is bad. Um, and we found that most species either weren't area sen or scale sensitive, their lines were flat, or they got more sensitive at larger scales. So unfortunately, our conversion to crop um, at all scales is, uh, once again, Kind of confirming that's not a great thing for grass and birds. So, sort of mixing discussion with implications here, I want to actually give a couple examples of why we think this might matter and how uh, we can use this to inform our landscape conservation. Henslow sparrows and meadowlarks provide really good examples. So, just to refresh you, the Henslow sparrow wants big patches right around it, it wants lots of idle grass doesn't want crop, uh, doesn't want pasture, so how do we get that on the landscape? Um, you know, we're probably not going to have a lot of success going to our landowners and saying, it'd be great if you could convert your whole farm to idle grass and then talk your immediate neighbors into doing the same thing, and none of you will make any money, but you'll do great things for this little bird that you've never seen before. <laughs> <laughs> So we may have to think of this as more of a public land species, where we can get our state and our federal agencies working with our NGOs to buy up big chunks of land and then focus on the immediate landscape around them. So we have a very clear focus of what to do to improve things for Henslow sparrows. Now eastern meadowlarks weren't really area sensitive, they weren't responding to patch size, they weren't scale sensitive. Basically, they just don't want forests, they don't want corn, they want grass on the landscape. <clears throat> and they're responding very positively to pasture. So this is a species where it seems like they probably can work well on private lands and in property scale management. So we can team up uh, with other organizations to go out and promote very good, responsible grazing and try to get our landowners to not convert everything to crop keep um, you know, that good pasture habitat on the landscape, we can probably do great things for this species, and it's a species that they can see. Landowners are probably much more likely to care about this guy, who they know who he is, uh, <coughs> as opposed to a little brown bird that only we care about. All right, so just to pull it all together, uh, so at one level, this is just another study showing that patch area is important for some species, landscapes are important for some species, 
what we think we're contributing is we're actually able to define a spatial scale now where we can really focus what we're doing instead of just saying, well, we want to work at a landscape scale. We can now say we want to work specifically at this uh, given spatial resolution. <coughs> now, the unfortunate thing is different species respond differently to different habitats at different scales. So there's no silver bullet. And we can't say, unfortunately, improve or increase this kind of habitat in patches of this size, at this resolution, or this scale. It's much more complicated than that. I can say yeah, more grass is better, less forest is better, but that's not very meaningful. Um, so you know, the big thing is this circles us back to defining objectives is the big thing. Um, we've got to know what we're trying to do if we're going to move forward. But we think this approach can help us once we know the species or the suite of species that we're really interested in. Um, we feel like it's a nice systematic approach to let us optimize our conservation to do the most for meeting that objective. All right, so I want to thank USGS uh, and Wisconsin DNR for funding. Uh, we did use a lot of volunteer citizen scientists to collect this data, as well as WDNR staff and Fish and Wildlife interns, uh, who are basically also volunteers, who want their paid. Um, and I'll take any questions. We have yeah, we've got about five minutes for discussion here. Thanks. So what we think is going on there, we actually have very high, I don't remember what Joe's threshold was, we have very high yeah. classes. Uh, I think grass is pretty good, it was yeah. uh, above 85%. Yeah. That's the right grass. So, the, you know, so I don't think it's a classification error, it's more of a, probably a juxtaposition issue. And when we look at that map where you find idle grass is on kind of marginal landscapes or on steep slopes where we can't farm. And so we think what's happening is the other land recover type that occurs in those same places is forest. So that weird effect of idle grass and with some of the other plots we see weird effects of forest. What I think is really going on there is because idle grass and forest tend to occur very close to each other and not necessarily close to cropland. We're getting a little confusion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with respect to your models, did you did you at all explore interactions between patch size and, and landscape and stuff? So I've said like maybe small patches, the, the effects are greater in terms of landscape than the large patches. No, we we intentionally kept the model structure pretty simple. Um, I think part of why we like for eastern meadowlarks, probably why we didn't see much of a patch effect is we're doing it. Um, so we made sure we were only in one cover type from doing the survey. And since we're doing 100 meter fixed radius point count, that constrains our patch to have to be at least 3.14 hectares. So if there is a sensitivity, perhaps it occurs below that for meadowlarks. Um, and yeah, and, and I think that is interesting. And probably there could be some interactions, even at larger scales, between patch area and landscape composition. But to keep it simple and applicable, we kept the structure pretty straightforward. Your occupancy estimates, they were associated with each patch as a whole? Yes. Yeah, and that's, that's what I think, because we were constrained to at least a pi hectare patch, really seeing some of those effects may occur at a scale that's much smaller than what we were able to capture just because of our study design.
Since you're essentially the model is looking at habitat selection, so as the birds arrive, what areas they're picking. And since meadowlarks show up first, it looks like meadowlarks and bobblings are kind of queuing in on the same stuff. It'd be interesting to throw some social factors in there. Since meadowlarks are there first, bobblings might be queuing on them. And so you could add a social component to that to see if there's some kind of you know, specific or specific tracking kind of stuff. Yeah. Specific tracking, so. yeah, I hadn't gone there. That is interesting. And, and because of Bowman's richness, you would think, I mean, occupancy is kind of going to get to that, but density would be interesting. But you'd think that for the, neighbor, the question about the neighborhoods is interesting because obviously they want to get a neighborhood where there's others around <coughs> to take advantage of. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. One more question? Andy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now the downside of everything. <laughs> Thanks very much, Bob.